Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Hey, welcome back. Now is the time we go around the room and introduce ourselves. <laughs> My name is Jay Corbett. <coughs> I'm Jim Clay. I'm Buck Wales. I'm Howard D. Port. I'm Dan Moran. I'm Alan. Rich. Jay. My name is Harley Shapiro. I'm Kay Matsuda. <coughs> William. Lee. Sorry. Adam. <coughs> My name is Gary. Paul. My name is Tony. Uh, hi, I'm Alza. <coughs> I'm Bill. Gary Dexter. I'm David. Peter. My name is Michael. Jim. Richard Azzolini, Andreas, Tim Stewart, and Jerry. My name is Roy. My name is Peter. Ron. <coughs> My name is Ray Dyer. I'm George. William. Peter. <coughs> My name is John Wessel. Peter Lando. Trenton. Kurt. Anyone else? Robert. Anyone here for the first or second time? Welcome. Please stay after we have uh, some food and tea for about half an hour. Today our speaker is a Sangha member, Dave Lewis. Uh, Dave has been a member of the Sangha for three or four years now. He has studied the Dharma for 35 years and first in the Vajra. Vajrayana tradition, and more recently in the Vipassana or Theravada tradition. He is currently enrolled in the Spirit Rock Meditation Center's dedicated practitioners program, and he will give us a talk on the Four Noble Truths. Welcome, David. Thank you. I really am happy to be here this morning. <laughs> Our speakers say that all the time, but it's kind of Sounds perfunctory, but <clears throat> I'm really kind of happy this morning. Um, and I've been thinking about the Four Noble Truths and doing a little bit of reminder kind of research. Um, so my it, it's been my focus for a couple of weeks. <clears throat> and I thought about speaking without notes. But I just don't quite have the nerve, so they're here, and I might get off script. <laughs> um, Thirty-five years in practice is a little misleading. Um, I did indeed go on my first meditation retreat when I was a teenager, when I was like 17 years old. And I had a double major in college, and one of my majors was comparative religion, and it's kind of focused on Eastern religions and Buddhism, and I kind of identified more with Buddhism than any of the other religions, but I'm really interested in all of them. For 35 years, it kind of, you know, Buddhism, Buddhism's been my thing. But I really didn't practice very much or very seriously until the last five years or less. And I can tell you it's a whole different ball game when you start practicing seriously. <laughs> Um, I used to, I would, you know, read Buddhist books and like Thich Nhat Hanh and go on a retreat every once in a while, go listen to speakers. But um, the Buddha taught and emphasized that um, 
what he was put, putting forth was a practice, was a path. It's, it's something you do. It's not something you wrap your mind around. It's not something you you can learn or understand. You don't have to be intelligent to get the Buddha's path and to move very far along it. Buddhism's not really a religion. It was kind of made a religion by Western missionaries and explorers in the 19th century who named it Buddhism. Buddhism wasn't called Buddhism before Westerners named it that. If you asked a practitioner in Tibet or Japan or Southeast Asia um, before the 19th century, what they did, they'd say they're following the path or following in the steps of the Buddha or doing the practice. And sometimes it was more devotional and sometimes it was more meditative, but it was something you did. It's not something you studied or understood. So there's a little bit of misunderstanding about that. And a lot of what I want to talk about this morning is some of the misconceptions around Four Noble Truths and the practice. Some of the misconceptions that Buddhisms have in the West, I think, as it's come to us, is that it's some kind of a New Age practice. We, we like Buddhism because it's affirmative and there's New Age affirmations and it makes us feel good, as opposed to some of the other religions that are practiced in the West. Or that it's an esoteric metaphysical thing that is kind of far away and hard to understand and um, interesting, but I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to reach nirvana because that's something that's just impossible. Another misconception is that it's about mystical, mystical states. That, again, something that you know might not be applicable to me. Well, none of those things are true, in my opinion. In Buddhist practice, the Buddhist has sometimes been um, described as a doctor, or metaphorically described as a doctor, and that certainly applies to his teachings around the Four Noble Truths. A doctor diagnoses a problem, identifies its cause, and prescribes a cure. And the Four Noble Truths is exactly that. The first noble truth, dukkha, is the identification of the problem. The second noble truth, which is um, the cause of dukkha, is the cause of the problem. And the fourth, third and fourth noble truths about freedom and the cure are the cure to the path. It's something you do. And it's not something we, hopefully, it's not something we think about doing at some point in the future. It's something we could do it's something we all just did as we were sitting this morning. As we let our minds rest and let our minds relax, watched our thoughts, experienced our thoughts as being these kind of temporary things that pass in and out, that teaches impermanence. One of the central um, teachings of the Buddha is impermanence. That's something we experience when we sit this morning. So we all practiced, and some of you, I bet, a bunch of people in this room had moments of awakening. You might not have seen it that way this morning as you were sitting, but a moment of awakening is any time when we let go of clinging to thoughts, any time we just let them go, or let them be, our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations, and realize them as impermanent, mental states that don't really belong to me. They just pass through me. <clears throat> so awakening is available here and now. Not a big deal. We get caught up, kind of caught up in this idea of nirvana and it being something far away, but nirvana is simply awakening. And nirvana is a permanent state of that freedom from clinging to... to um, thoughts, ideas, um, desires, but we can experience that on a temporary level and it brings real relief and real um, release in our lives, even just this morning. So true happiness, the way Buddha taught it, is not about acquiring anything and it's not about um, gaining some esoteric knowledge. And it's not about studying. True happiness 
is about letting go of our illusions of um, what we think we want and what we need and revealing our true nature. In the Mahayana tradition, the true na- our true nature is called our Buddha nature and it's something that we already have. What we're seeking is something that we already have. My favorite depiction of this in the West is The Wizard of Oz. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorite movies. But um, it's an incredible Dharma story. Dorothy falls into de- delusion. She gets bopped in the head, but she falls into delusion. She goes to this magical place. She's shown a path to follow to get back to what she wants, to get home. Dorothy wants to go home. She's shown a path, the yellow, yellow brick road. And along the way, on that path, she meets other deluded characters. She meets a scarecrow that thinks he, well, a scarecrow thinks he doesn't have a mind. Um, the tin man thinks he doesn't have a heart. The lion thinks he doesn't have courage. And they all follow this path, this complicated path with challenges and complications. And end up at this place, you remember at the end, where Dorothy realizes she always has been home. She didn't have to do all of that. Or maybe she had to do that to realize that what she was seeking, she already had. She already was home. The Tin Man already had a heart. He had a huge heart. We saw it during the course of the movie, but he, he was deluded. He didn't think he had one. The Lion had courage. Um, they all had what they were seeking. And the whole process of exploration was finding that which they already had. So um, another way that the Buddha described the path, um, and he used this reference often, was that it's, it's something you master, it's something you learn. And it's like learning how to play an instrument or learning a sport. But he very often used music because uh, he was musically trained. The Buddha was um, a wealthy guy, a wealthy prince, and he'd been musically trained, so he used that as a metaphor. So it's, it's something you learn in meditation, um, which is what we all come here to do in the morning, is the only part of the path, but it's the training part of the path. And in terms of comparing it with music, Meditation is like playing scales. It's something we do to become um, conversant with the music that we're hoping to practice. But playing scales, you know, isn't what music's all about. It's just, you know, part of what we do. And I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. So, the Four Noble Truths. Um, In a way, we could spend um, the whole year talking about the Four Noble Truths. When I told one of my teachers I was going to be talking about the Four Noble Truths, he just chuckled and he said, there's only one Dharma talk. It's the Four Noble Truths. Everything in Buddhism can be contained in the Four Noble Truths. No matter what you talk about, it can somehow be fit into the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are, first one, dukkha. Life is difficult. (coughs) is inherently challenging because it requires constant accommodation to changing, often painful conditions. I'll come back to this again. Second noble truth. Suffering is the insatiable need to have things other than they are. That's the cause of suffering. The need to have things other than they are. I want more of this, I want less of that. Third noble truth. Freedom from suffering is possible because peace and happiness do not depend on what's going on in our lives, but how we respond to it. My favorite expression of this is, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Suffering is what we add to pain. So suffering isn't something that happens out there. Suffering is how we respond to what happens out there. And the fourth noble truth is the doctor's prescription. It's a program of practices to promote to promote freedom and happiness. So coming back to the first noble truth, um, 
dukkha. I'm trying not to use the word suffering too much, and that's the common Western, common English translation for dukkha. And that's because I think it misleads us. And even if it doesn't mislead us, we tend to be terrified of suffering. Suffering is what we turn away from. It's what we're conditioned to do in our culture. It's we, we avoid suffering. If suffering happens, we do something else, we distract ourselves. But dukkha, well, let me give you some other words that have been used. And these are all accurate translations in their own way. Dukkha can be dissatisfaction, discomfort, stress. I know one of my favorite Buddhist te- teachers never says suffering. He always says stress. Dukkha is stress. Anxiety, remorse, instability, disappointment, lack of control. Big one, lack of control. Anybody ever had that in their lives? It's dukkha. <laughs> Anger, longing. Simply wanting more of this and less of that. Wanting things to be different. Again, we're conditioned to be resistant, and especially in our culture. We're conditioned to be resistant to suffering and to turn away from it. What the first noble truth asks us to do is to just sit with our suffering. Don't turn away from it. Don't fall into it wholeheartedly. Just notice it. Allow it to be. To be with our suffering rather than wanting it to go away. Um, I did, some of you were here last week for Daniel's talk, which I just thought was wonderful. It was really inspirational. But he referred to um, the Buddha's life, the Buddha's upbringing in life as a prince. And I won't go over the story all over again because you're more than last week. But the Buddha was a pampered prince. And his father was worried because there had been a prediction that the, that the Buddha, a, a, a soothsayer or a psychic, had said when the Buddha was born that he's either going to be a great king or he's going to be a great spiritual leader. And the Buddha's father, being a king, wanted him to be a king, wanted him to stay in the family business. So um, the, the way the Buddha's father dealt with this was to distract him to give him everything he wanted, to give him women, wine, song, dance, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The Buddha had everything he wanted, whenever he wanted it. And he found this, he found dissatisfaction in his life. The Buddha had wisdom even in the midst of all that delusion. The Buddha knew that that wasn't quite enough. Something was missing in his life. He went out looking for it. The story of the Buddha's early life is why I think that Buddhism is so incredibly appropriate for our age. Because I think in modern America, we're all princes. We're all really wealthy people in this room, compared with people in third world countries and most of the world. You know, even if we don't think of ourselves as wealthy, if you have the t- a TV, if you have the internet, if you have a roof over your head, enough to eat, a cell phone, you got more than an awful lot of people in this world have. You're wealthy, like the Buddha. And like the Buddha, you have a phenomenal number of distractions available to you. You can watch TV. If you in a relationship you don't like, you can change it. Not everybody in the world has that option. If you're in a job you don't like, you can change it. If you don't like your house, your apartment, you can move. If you don't like town, you can move. If you're not satisfied with where you live, you can change. We have these phenomenal range of options. There was an ad um, that they kept playing before Christmas that was just driving me nuts in the, in the paper, from the New York Times, from uh, AT&T. <clears throat> it was for their smartphone, for the, for the iPhone, and, the biggest print of the ad, full page ad, orange, probably you might have seen it. Was the, and the biggest print was, now you can talk and surf the net at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> On your cell phone, so you can walk and talk and surf the net at the same time. This was the selling point. You know, as a mindfulness practitioner, right, that gave me the creeps. <laughs> but, if you went down and read the frame print underneath, that's not all. And 
There's 100,000 apps available. 100,000 ways of distracting yourself. You know, you never have to sit at a bus stop in the peace of your own mind again. In fact, you never have to sit in the peace of your mind ever again. You have 100,000 apps available to you. So, like the Buddha, we have distractions available to us. And those distractions are, many of them, not all of them, but many of them are about turning away from suffering. They give us the opportunity not to be with our suffering. So, you might say, why not? Why not turn away from our suffering? Because the Buddha realized, and you and I can realize through practice, try this out for yourself, that when you don't, when, when you turn away from your suffering, it merely perpetuates the suffering. If you stuff your grief, the grief's not going to go away. So the first noble truth is really about simply being in the moment. Whatever's going on, whether it's pleasant, whether it's painful, just be in the moment. And you'll realize, as we realized this morning when we were meditating, that whatever's going on is temporary. Bad mood, just let it be a bad mood. It'll pass. Good mood, unfortunately, that's going to pass too. So let's move on to the second noble truth. The misconception around the second noble truth is that it's desire. Ask a lot of people what the second noble truth is. What's the cause of suffering? People say desire. It's not really desire. Well, yeah, it is desire, but it's more than desire. Desire can be um, skillful or unskillful. So, for instance, if you have a desire to intensify your spiritual path or desire to meditate more or desire for your children to be happy and healthy. Those are skillful desires. Nothing wrong with that. What the second noble truth is really all about is attachment desire or attachments. Um, Sometimes it's called clinging. So... Even skillful desires, like a desire to um, follow the path more intensively, if we cling to them, they can become unskillful. But an awful lot of our desires are inherently unskillful. And when we say desire, um, it's not only wanting things. Desire is also about not wanting things. Desire is wanting things to be different than they are. So if you want more of this, that's desire. If you want less of that, that's desire too. And the more intensively you want change, the more intensively you want more of this or less of that, the greater the desire is. And the Buddha would say, the greater the suffering. Clinging to desire is the cause of stress and anxiety. The Buddha said, he who understands clinging and non-clinging understands all of the Dharma. Simple as that. So, I got a little example. When we think about suffering, a lot of times we think about um, the big sufferings. And it is kind of scary to think about old age illness and death Um, but if you think of dukkha simply as dissatisfaction sometimes on a really subtle level then you start to understand what the Buddha taught about suffering being an aspect of our lives that's present in every moment of our lives Just be aware of <laughs> Snickers? what your yeah, Snickers. That's the third stage on the dependent <laughs> origin, origination path. <clears throat> I'm there. <laughs> it's a Snickers bar. 
be aware of how you're reacting to that. The Buddha taught, um, and boy, I could talk for an hour about this, but dependent origination is this concept that the Buddha, it's, it's a flow chart the Buddha came up with about how suffering happens. So let me try to simplify it using a Snickers bar. Dependent origination is the path that leads from your con you coming into contact with an object, your senses, your eyes, your smell maybe, coming in contact with an object and what happens and how that leads to suffering. You know, this is simply a thing I'm holding up and you're seeing it. But your senses and your mind are going through this whole um, kind of complicated trail of process around how you react to this. If you like this thing I'm holding up, here's here's the path, here's the flow chart, the, the, the flow. And if you if you if you meditate on this, um, you'll see it in your own experience. The first thing you experienced, and you probably didn't notice this, the first thing you experienced it was either a sense of pleasant or unpleasant. This, when he held this up, I had a pleasant reaction or an unpleasant reaction. What followed on that was, I like it or I don't like it. So let's say you had a pleasant reaction. I held this up and you went, ooh, I like that. Before you even got to the point of liking it, it was pleasant. And before you even got to the point of liking it, you named it. You said, oh, that's a Snickers as Jim did, Snickers. <clears throat> it's pleasant, I like it. Next step on the chain is, I want it. I want one of those, or I wish I had that. Next step on the chain is, I gotta have that. Next step on the chain is, this is just kind of taking over my whole thought process. Now I'm really kind of obsessed on this Snickers bar. I'm a person that needs to have a Snickers bar. <laughs> So this is oversimplified description, but you can see where I'm going with this, is that the suffering, can, the suffering increases as your wanting, as your clinging increases. At the point where you see this and you say that's a pleasant thing, you're not suffering. But every stage of the process, as it goes through the stages, you cling a little bit more to the point where I've got to have that, and I'm going to be unhappy if I don't have that. Likewise, if you don't like Snickers, or you're allergic to chocolate, or you're allergic to peanuts, I hold this up, you're going to have a, ooh, that's unpleasant. I don't like that. That's a Snickers bar. Keep that away from me. Why is this guy holding this Snickers bar up in front of me? It's really annoying me. I wish he'd put it away. I don't want to see a Snickers bar. I really hate him. That's how hate comes about. That's where hate comes from. So that's called dependent origination. That's the chain of dependent origination. And that happens to us many times a minute throughout the day, many times a minute, many, many, many times an hour. Our senses, eyes, ears, nose, taste, come into contact with objects. They're pleasant or they're unpleasant. Sometimes they're neutral. They're pleasant or they're unpleasant or neutral, and then we go down the chain of dependent origination where we end up loving or hating, having to have, or divorcing. That's dukkha. That's, that's the true sense of dukkha when the Buddha said, our lives are dukkha. Our lives are many experiences, a minute, an hour, of wanting, of not wanting. So by practicing and meditating and getting more experienced and learning this path, what we learn to do is notice that process, become more aware of it as our senses come into contact with things, and things include thoughts and emotions. Our senses come in contact with thoughts and emotions, and we learn um, we learn what our mind does and we learn what our preferences, preferences, are, preferences are. And as we do that, 
we discover that if we pay attention, if we're paying attention, if we're mindful of what happens in our heads when this thing appears, we can actually short circuit the process. We can stop at pleasant. Or we can stop at I like. I can say, I like this, I like Snickers bars. That's a pleasant thing. I like Snickers bars, but I don't have to have it. And save ourselves a lot of suffering. <clears throat> Likewise, if you don't like Snickers bar, that's a Snickers bar. I don't like it. Doesn't matter to me. I don't care if he's holding it up. Life goes on. That's how we release from attachment. And it takes some practice. And meditation really helps a lot. The practice of meditation helps in that noticing how we react to things and being with our experience. So we pass our days jumping from one desire to another. And that, in Sanskrit, is called samsara, the wheel of suffering, samsara. Just passing our days, jumping from one desire to another. Grabbing for this and pushing away that. So the third noble truth is the good news. There's freedom from this. Freedom from clinging. Um, and I just described you know, how you do that. Is you practice noticing how your mind works, what you cling to, what you like, what you don't like, how you feel about that, and just being with it. Not pushing it away, because that's desire, that's clinging. Just allowing it to be and noticing that it's temporary and it's going to pass. We can free ourselves from suffering by changing our response to suffering. Suffering is something we cause in our own lives. So the practice is, and meditation is the scales that we practice to, 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 to learn this, the practice is noticing whether there's clinging in this moment and noticing what happens when we bring our attention to it. Simple as that. Noticing whether we're clinging and noticing what happens when we bring our attention to it. You might find it simply dissolves. When you notice you're clinging to something, have you ever noticed that when you're just kind of obsessed with something and you wear yourself out, you know, your mind is spinning and you just get tired of thinking about it and you just finally just kind of intuitively let go? That's letting go of clinging. So that's suffering and that's freedom from suffering. And the fourth noble truth is the path that the Buddha set out, the path is simply a blueprint. It's a list of eight things, eight practices that we do in no particular order. You can focus on one or another. You can focus on all of them at once. You can do them as a cycle. It's a blueprint for how we go about freeing ourselves from suffering. Once again, I could spend a whole hour, a whole Dharma talk on each one of the factors of the path. A lot can be said about them, so let me summarize. In the first place, so there's this list of eight things. There, you can kind of divide them up into three categories, three general broad categories. One is, in Pali, the word is sila, which is ethics. And that includes speech, action, and livelihood. What we do, how we behave, um, what we speak about in the world, our outwardly behavior and appearance, has a lot to do with our happiness. Now, the Buddha tended to stress that um, the golden rule, as Jesus did, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But the Buddha talked about sila not so much in terms of do good things for other people, be compassionate to other people because that's the right thing to do or to do it on their behalf. The Buddha said, do it for yourself. One of the primary reasons that we practice sila, that we practice ethics, is because that short circuits remorse in our lives and remorse causes a great deal of suffering. So by practicing right behavior, right speech, right livelihood, and being right and true with the world, kind and compassionate with other people. You have nothing to be remorseful about. 
And that's happiness. Happiness simply arises. That's a cause of happiness. The second group of um, teachings in the Eight Noble Path are called samadhi, which is often um, is often defined as concentration, but it's meditation and mindfulness, and it's really um, a better way of putting it. I think is a calm, harmonious mind. The Buddha said, in order to work along this path, in addition to ethics, it's important to meditate. And the meditation is the tool that we use to gain a calm, harmonious mind. There might be other ways of doing it, but that's what worked best for him and most people in the last 3,500 years um, that have practiced the path um, find that works for them. So meditation practice is important. It's not everything, but it is important. And the goal of meditation is a calm, harmonious mind, which gives us insight, leads to insight. And the third group on the Eightfold Path, are in the Pali word is pana, and that's wisdom. And it's not so much the wisdom you gain by reading books or listening to, listening to Dharma talks um, or studying, <coughs> But wisdom is um, a discernment that you gain from meditating and from insight. The practice of insight, the practice of meditation, leads to wisdom. So, what are the eightfold, pa- the, the actual eightfold path points? The first is wise view, and wise view can be as simply defined as understanding and accepting the Four Noble Truths. If you buy the Four Noble Truths, you have wise view. Wise intention is the next point, and um, we could talk about that for hours, but intention is all important in Buddhism. Intention is actually more important than action. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason, and the Buddha taught that all of our actions, all of our speech comes from intention. Why is speech is the next point. Um, really a hard thing to practice, I find. Why is speech? It's a big part of my practice, and I'm, I'm still working on it. But very often, um, a, a simplified way of, if you're thinking about what to say, a simplified formula is, is it true? Is it useful? Is it timely? Sometimes if you have something to say to somebody, it, it, it might be true. <clears throat> that might not be useful, or it might be timely. It might not be the right time to say it. So if speech doesn't meet these three criteria, true, useful, and timely, Buddha said, just don't do it. Don't say it. Wise action is the next point. Wise action is karma. Karma is, the, the, the actual translation of the word karma is action. Karma is what you do. So wise action arises from wise intention. If you have the right intention, you're going to do the right action. One place to start, if you're thinking about practicing wise action more intentionally, is the five precepts. Avoiding killing, avoiding stealing, avoiding lying, avoiding sexual misconduct, and avoiding the use of intoxicants that can cloud your mindfulness, cloud your judgment. Wise livelihood is the next point, and that's basically teaches us that what you do with your life, how you work, <clears throat> your profession perhaps, or just your preoccupations, um, has a lot to do with your role on the path. The path, practicing Dharma isn't just meditating, it isn't just showing up at GBF on Sunday mornings, but what you do with every day of your week, every hour of your day. Wise effort, we're getting into the concentration and meditation parts, which are three steps on the path, first being wise effort. Wise effort is directing your attention so that you do not get caught up in various mind states. Getting caught up in various mind states is clinging. We talked about clinging. Seeing that Snickers bar and your mind goes off in 
all your associations with Snicker bar, Snickers bar, that's clinging. Why is effort is saying it's just a Snickers bar? Let's move on. Why is mindfulness is paying attention? It's something that we do in meditation. It's something we practice in meditation. And it's something that very easily spills over into everyday life. The more we meditate, the more we practice, the more natural it becomes in our daily life at work and our relationships and our walking around town. It includes investigation of experience, not only paying attention to what's going on, but what's the truth of this? What's it really all about? And it includes compassion. It's really important when we're sitting in meditation and we have monkey mind and stuff's going on and we have thoughts of remorse or grief or we're worrying about something that's happening later, it's really important to have compassion around that because we can't, we can't find peace by judging ourselves or by criticizing our experience, either in meditation or in everyday life. It doesn't produce skillful effects. So if we apply compassion to our practice, no matter what comes up, even if it's something we're not comfortable with or we don't like about ourselves, we can be compassionate about it. And finally, why is concentration? Why is concentration is simply the ability to collect and unify the mind. I can't stress more the value of why is concentration to my daily life and how my practices supported me in this. And I was noticing it this morning while we were sitting, uh, or after we were sitting, I really had kind of a lovely sitting this morning. I don't know about you, but my mind was calm and relaxed, and I wasn't thinking about this talk. So I don't know about you, but I used to get a lot more nervous about sitting up in front of a group and talking and the first few Dharma talks that I ever gave, um, I was a wreck. You know, I didn't sleep well the night before, and if there was a sitting before the talk, I'd sit there going over my talk in the sitting. Well, I didn't do that today. I just kind of meditated, let my mind find a calm, relaxed place, didn't think about the talk, and that's the result of my practice. I can only do that because I practice as much as I have. So, you know, think about the value of knowing you're going to be sitting in front of a group of people giving a talk and not having to worry about it. That for me today, that's the benefit of my practice. And I'm so grateful for it. So, um, wow. That's the Four Noble Truths, and I did it in 45 minutes. I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> um, the Buddha taught for 40 years, I think, 35 or 40 years. Um, and we have you know, great volumes full of suttas, full of his talks. But everything he talked about, and the Buddha often referred back to this, the, everything he talked about, comes back to the noble, Four Noble Truths, somehow fits within the Four Noble Truths. When the Buddha was asked by um, strangers, and there's stories of strangers coming up to the Buddha and saying, what do you teach? His, one of his most common responses it, it was, I teach suffering and the end of suffering. I teach suffering and the end of suffering. That's all. He didn't like big metaphysical Concepts that people asked him about the existence of God or life after death or this, you know, metaphysical stuff. He just didn't answer. If it didn't refer to suffering or the release from suffering, he didn't think it was relevant to his teaching. So everything fits in the Four Noble Truths, and it's a lot simpler than you might have thought it was. So thank you for your patience this morning. That was discursive, and that was Cliff Notes for Four Noble Truths. Does anybody have questions or comments or alternate um, interpretations? Um, I'm somewhat new to, uh, to practices, and I guess um, being new to it and kind of the way I use it is um, 
I'm okay with a little satisfaction and suffering in my life, but there's some type of balance between joy and peace and satisfaction that I want, um, joy and peace and dissatisfaction that I want to have a balance with. And so I use the practices that way. Um, I'm not really sure I believe there's an end of suffering in any consistent way, at least that's my experience. Um, the second thing would be, what about making changes in your life and yourself in a way and doing it, but without so much attachment? So I just want to see what your thoughts on all that is. Well, on, on that first point, um, I want to go back to the, the, this idea that the when the Buddha said there was an end to suffering, he wasn't saying there's an end, end to pain. The Buddha himself experienced a lot of pain during his life and talked about it. So suffering is what we add to pain, but it, 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 it's how we cling to pain, cling around pain, how we get, get attached. So he's not the Buddha's not saying that there's no pain. Um, he's saying that the way that we cling to pain and attach to it is, is optional. We don't have to do that. Somebody could have cancer, say, and think, oh, poor me, this is awful, I've been cursed, um, I have this terrible disease, um, I'm going to die, I might as well um, um, take morphine and sit and watch TV and, and wait to die. That's one way of approaching it. Another person might have cancer and say, okay, this is just an element of my life. This is an illness that's come up that um, I can deal with, I can live with. It's not going to change my life. Um, I can still have joy in my life and cancer. I can still have friends and cancer. I can still do my activities. Um, and I might be cured and I might not be cured, but um, it's not the ruling factor in my life. You can see your glass is half full or you can see your glass is half empty. They're both true. It's just a matter of perspective. So when the Buddha talked about attaching to, to, to pain, um, the suffering that comes from attaching to pain, is that suffering is optional, depending on your attitude and how your reaction was. And I'm sorry if I didn't get the second, uh, the second part. I forgot. Oh, already. Um, kind of that idea about um, feeling like, as, as we do most, most of our waking lives, is we have, we have goals, we make changes in external circumstances we want to make changes in ourselves but you know from the Buddhist practice I often am not quite as goal oriented not so attached to the to the result but, I, but um, there is that so, so kind of that idea with everything is okay the way the way it is nothing needs to be changed like desire and clinging but in our normal life we we're goal oriented yeah, it's um, it's okay to have goals. Um, goals are you know motivate us and direct us, um, but the Buddha tends to stress the intention over goals. And intentions are different than goals. Goals are a way that we want the future to be different. It's our picture of the way we want the future to be. It might not turn out that way, and if it doesn't turn out that way, we're going to suffer. Intention is what we do in this very moment about. You know, my actions in this very moment, my speech, my whatever I'm, I'm going to do, um, happens right now. So um, we're, we're not saying it's wrong to be go it, it, it's wrong to have goals. Just be aware of the extent to which you attach to them. Um, I, I know a person, um, a, a friend of mine, who uh, a, a woman who desperately wanted to be married because she thought marriage was going to bring happiness to her life and was going to fix everything. Really desperately wanted to get married. And she, wanted the she went on the internet and she found a guy and she married him and she's not happy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, she, she's, her suffering is still there. Well, she had this goal that she thought was going to solve her problem, but that wasn't, you know, the, 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 that wasn't really the problem. And we got that from Daniel last week, right, when he was talking about um, New Year's resolutions and, and looking underneath the resolution for what 
was really the issue, what was really the problem. I, I thought that was a wonderful teaching because what it said to me is that a lot of our, our resolution is not the not really the proper solution for what our dissatisfaction is. Um, I, I gained a lot from that teaching. Jim. Um, did you see specific gay um, impulses for suffering? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, we have caught, we have, a lot of us grew up with a lot of extra suffering because our parents, our culture, the world around us told us we weren't okay the way we are. Um, and so I think that's a real challenge for gay people, that extra suffering that we, we have to overcome. Um. And I think I, I, the the bravery that I see in the gay world, uh, and the many ways that people have overcome um, that extra suffering, um, is pretty profound. But another place where I see suffering in the gay world that I, I find gay people not so willing to address, and Brooke and I gave a Dharma talk about this once, is sexuality. The Buddha taught. That sexuality is a cause of suffering, no matter whether you're gay or straight or anything. It's about wanting and not wanting. I want him. I don't want him. I want that. I don't want that. I like this type. I don't like that type. It's all about wanting something other than what we have and being unhappy with what we have and not necessarily being grateful with what we have. So sexuality causes a lot of suffering. doesn't mean it's bad. Sexuality can be beautiful and intimate and, and connected. And it can cause a lot of suffering. But I, th I think, my own theory, is that because our sexuality, for ma so many of us, was repressed in our childhood, now we're not willing to question it in any way. And I think with sexuality, like every other aspect of our life, we have to look, up, look at the ways it causes suffering. You know, if I spend an hour a day looking at porn on the computer, it's useful to take a moment out of that hour and think, is this causing happiness? Or is, it, is this a cause of happiness? Or is this a cause of suffering? Every aspect of our lives, that question can be applied to. Is what I'm doing, thinking, feeling, right now, in this moment, a cause of suffering? Or is it a cause of happiness? We might discover that a lot of things we do that we think we're doing to make ourselves more happy are actually causes of suffering. Of course. So, if we should hold any other questions afterwards, if we're short on time. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? <coughs> Hi, I'm Kay, and I'm the host this morning. And it's refreshment, so please stay uh, for the social hour and enjoy uh, refreshment and tea. If you use teacups, please wash them and put them back on the rack. Uh, there's also a sign-up sheet uh, uh, out there, so if you're new and like to stay in touch with this group, uh, please uh, leave your name, street address, and email address so that we can stay in touch with you. Uh, third, uh, there usually is a group of people who go out and have lunch, and the group usually meet around the, the front door uh, around 12.30 or thereabout. So if you're interested in joining the group, look for the group, or let, us, let some of us know, and we'll locate the group for you. And finally, I'll be coming around with the Dino Ball, and the suggested donation amount is 5 to $8. Uh, but uh, please be generous, and it, it, we're more, we are happy to take whatever the amount, but particularly if the amount is above the suggested donation amount. Anyway, th welcome, and thank you. <coughs> Any, Jim? Yeah. Um, the third weekend of March, the Saturday, I think it's the 23rd, is that right? 20th. 20th. Um, we're going to have a day-long retreat here. We, we tried it out last year, and it was a wonderful day. Um, the steering committee has yet to finish the planning of it, but it will at least involve uh, different sets of um, sitting and walking and group discussions and maybe a Dharma talk and um, some delicious food and 
Um, so we're, it was it was a it was a big hit last year. So we're going to repeat it. Um, so save that save that date. Thank you. Other announcements. Our uh, speaker next week will be uh, also Jennings. Uh, also um, presented last year a couple times. He's quite a charismatic and and a fun individual. Quite an intriguing resume. So we look forward to his presentation next week. Okay. Other announcements? <clears throat> All right. Let's gather in a circle. Let's everywhere plagued with sufferings of body and mind quickly be freed from their illnesses. May those frightened cease to be afraid, and may those bound to be free. May the powerless find power, and may people think of befriending one another. May those who find themselves in trackless, fearful wilderness, the children, the aged, the unprotected, be guarded by beneficent celestials, and may they swiftly attain Buddhahead. May we all. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.